So let's talk a little bit more about the Internet Protocol and IPv4 for a bit. So I mentioned this already a little little bit about IPs, and uh, we'll get more into that and start talking about how to create subnets and the parts of the IP address uh, structure. Uh, but to start out, the Internet Protocol works on Layer 3. And Layer 3, uh, which is our network layer, if you're referring to the OSI model, uh, offers four things. It offers addressing, uh, as I have there an example of an address, which is one of Google's DNS servers. Uh, it offers some sort of logical addressing of devices. So not physical addressing, which is the next layer that we'll talk about, but logical addressing. So I can configure some sort of address on my system that gets placed into the header when it uh, gets encapsulated, which is the next thing it offers. And then it'll traverse through the network and then be uh, decapsulated and then it'll read what address it has and then determine whether or not it's destined for that system and then other devices will figure out what to do with that address. So it offers addressing. It offers encapsulation as I mentioned. So as we talked about uh, a Prado protocol data unit going being chopped up from a main piece of data into segments. The segments then receive their, their port information uh, that gets placed into it, the, its header and encapsulated. It then gets passed to the next layer, uh, layer 3, which then also encapsulates it again with some logical addressing IP information, for example. It passes it uh, along through the network, and depending on where you're trying to go to, if it's um, to a different network within your internal network, like a large organization, or if you're trying to go out to the internet and access some other uh, system that's not local to you, you're going to be using routing of some kind, which is the third thing that it offers. Uh, and it offers the decision process that we'll talk about uh, quite a bit on how to send that that data that you have in here, our data. How do we send that data to its destination that you've placed into that header information? It will read that and then make a decision on what direction and what interfaces to send that out of uh, at each internetwork device along the way. Uh, that's bit called routing. It also offers decapsulation, so once it gets to those routers or it gets to its destination, it's going to do a little decapsulation of layer 2 at least to read the layer 3 information to see whether or not it's destined for that device or where it needs to go in the future. So it offers decapsulation as well. So encapsulation is the term used for going down the layers and then decapsulation is the term used for going up the layers towards the application. Uh, some examples of Layer 3 protocols. Uh, I have a couple of them listed here. We have IPv4, we have IPv6, and then some older ones that are dying or dead at this point, IPX and Apple Talk, and then there are some others as well. But um, IPv4 is the one that you'll see the most right now, and IPv6 is growing in popularity. Uh, IPv4 is a 32-bit address in dotted decimal format, like we saw there, so you're going to have four pieces to it separated by a dot and that could be something like 192, 168.1.1 1 .1, or something like that uh, and then IPv6 is a 128-bit address separated by colons so and it's also hexadecimal notation so this is a 32-bit address that's a dotted decimal notation IPv6 is a 128-bit address with hexadecimal colon notation so it could be something like FE80 colon and I'll do uh, another colon just because we'll, we'll talk about what that means uh, and then you know something like 0001 or whatever something like that and we'll talk a bit more about IPv6 and what that means and the differences but IPv4 was originally designed uh, at the beginnings of networking in the internet and it wasn't realized that we would expand in size so quickly so pretty pretty early on they realized we needed to come up with something new and that's how uh, we have network address translation that we'll talk about private addresses with RFC 1918 that we've mentioned already and we'll talk a bit uh, about a bit more uh, and then later on they realized we need those are stop gaps um, and we need to and there was another thing uh, as well which is subnetting and um, classless internet domain routing that we'll talk about but those were all stop gaps really uh, and then they, they realized we need to make a new version of IP and that's how we got IPv6 and that's what's now being used by new new connections, people who are asking for new addresses from IANA they're going to be receiving IPv6 addresses so that's the future and the present essentially at this time
uh, as of this uh, recording IPv4 has been exhausted on how many addresses that are available in the terms of the blocks of IPv4 addresses have been exhausted from IANA and they have been assigned to the different regional uh, groups that are out there such as um, Aaron or RIPE uh, and the other ones uh, and those regional groups have room still but they're being exhausted quickly so it's been exhausted but it hasn't been completely exhausted it's just the main pools have been exhausted out of IANA's control and they're now in the hands of the regional control so they're almost gone but now we have IPv6 and IPv6 is so huge it's trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of addresses um, I remember reading something about how there's enough addresses for uh, a trillion a trillion addresses per grain of sand on the planet or something like that it's 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 completely insane on how many addresses are available with IPv6 everything can get an address it's and beyond it's it's amazing uh, so they went from underkill to complete overkill <laughs> with, with the uh, with the version so and then we have IPX which is an older novel uh, layer 3 protocol you might see it in some uh, like school districts or something like that that have older equipment and they used to be an old novel shop uh, novel controlled a lot of networking in the early days and have since fallen out of favor so you may see some IPX uh, you may even see some old token ring if you're really unlucky <laughs> um, and then there's also some Apple talk uh, that might still be out there with some really old Apple products uh, it was the old Apple communications protocol before IP came in favor so some other properties that layer 3 provides uh, it's a connectionless uh, layer so it doesn't it doesn't do the connections that's the whole point of the OSI model and separating things by layer uh, layer 3 doesn't do connections layer 4 does that so we talked about that with transport layer creates those connections so it's a connectionless protocol any of the protocols should be connectionless uh, its best effort so it relies on layer 4 to determine whether or not that the those protocol data units get to where they're supposed to go the layer 3 doesn't care it tries to get it there it sends it on its way and it says good luck buddy hopefully you get to where you're supposed to go if it doesn't get there that's up to layer 4 the transport layer to determine whether or not it actually got there so that's where that TCP comes in uh, with best effort and making sure something is reliable or not or UDP in that case uh, so and it's also media independent so it relies on layer 2 so you can really see how these layers are interacting so we, we're relying on layer 4 for connection information and whether or not things are reliable or not and if we need to resend data uh, and we also don't care about what media we're traversing so we can send IP over fiber and we can send it over copper we can send it over radio waves we don't care it doesn't matter it's media independent it relies on layer 2 to do that and we'll start talking about that coming up uh, and how it passes that to layer 2 to then put its own header information on there to determine how to traverse that uh, physical infrastructure whatever that might be Uh, we mentioned about the encapsulation already so as we encapsulate we pass it down so when I, I mentioned the uh, layer 2 it's media independent and we rely on that once it gets to layer 2 it's also going to encapsulate this protocol data unit again with more information we'll talk about that where it's going to attach on a little bit more information there about um, some MAC address info maybe uh, so let's talk a bit about the IPv4 header. So we'll bring that up with our Wireshark instead of drawing it. So let's bring up our connection and we'll just go to a browser and open up something. There we go. So now we have some packets. So let's go take a look at one of these. If we go look at IP, take a look at our IPv4 header. So here's the header information. This is in the beginning before our data. And actually, let's let's find a good, here's an application data one. So this actually has real application data in it, parts of that web page that were being displayed uh, or retrieved. And in the header of that, we have not just 
the actual data which is securely encrypted here and not just our header information for layer 4 but we also have header information for layer 3 uh, header information for layer 2 that we're going to talk about coming up but if we look at the header information for layer 3 we can see there's fields for various different things here we have what version is it? Is it version 4? Is it version 6? Is it version something we don't know yet? It can be changed. How large is that header? Is there sometimes you can stuff other information in there uh, like quality of service it might change the size of your header uh, how long is this packet uh, which is a good determination of whether or not something went wrong with it in transit. Uh, some flags. Should we fragment or not fragment this? If this data is too large, uh, which is called an MTU, a maximum transmission unit, if it's too large, we can potentially break it in half and send it in smaller pieces. So this determines whether or not we're allowed to fragment that. And you can override these bits as well once you get to a router. You can say, no, nah, ignore the don't fragment bit. You can still fragment that. There's ways around it, but a lot of applications will turn on the don't fragment bit. Uh, fragment offset, if something does get fragmented, if it's too large, the fragment offset will let the TCP stack know, or the IP stack know, uh, how to rearrange it so that you know one side, one piece will be put in front of the other piece. That's what the offset does. It tells it you know, where, how to reorder them. Time to live is how many hops it's valid for. So here's the problem. If it's a connectionless best effort protocol. So we're going to send that data out onto the network, and it's going to do its routing. Remember we said routing is something that's available as part of layer 3. If, if there's a loop, for some reason, if we have a router that we then pass it to another router, and then that router passes it back to us for some reason because the routing information is wrong, it could go into an endless loop. And it might uh, you know, cause bandwidth to be taken up and uh, cause our routers to crash or something like that. The time to live defines how many hops along the way can we go before it discards that packet. So basically, it starts at a high value, such as 128 here. And then it will decrement, it'll go down, every single time it goes through some sort of router or layer 3 switch. It'll go through that, it'll decrement that by 1, and then if it gets to its destination before it reaches 0, then everything's good. If it reaches 0 by the time it uh, gets partway to its destination, whatever device that is, probably some sort of internet work device like a router or a switch, will drop it at that point. So that's our safeguard for creating endless loops of traffic in our uh, in our network and unfortunately it's, it's a nice idea but it's not perfect because we can have uh, you know so much data I mean look at all these packets just from opening one web page if we have thousands of users trying to you know do transmissions across their network and all of them are looping for some reason even though we have that time to live it's still going to bog down the network and cause problems so there's things that we'll talk about that can help resolve that but um, the time to live value is um, the integral built-in functionality of IP to help reduce that. We have uh, the protocol. So are we using TCP, UDP, ICMP? What are we using? Um, here you see it says 6. So each protocol has a different number assigned to it. So TCP is 6, UDP is 17, ICMP is 1. Uh, you'll see them in there. And uh, you can actually see it in the raw data there. It says 6. So that helps it uh, know what layer four uh, layer you know in layer four what it, what it's going to send it to is it going to send it to TCP is it going to send it to UDP what protocol are we using up the stack there uh, we have some checksum information so the header has uh, I mentioned like a CRC value a checksum where it pushes it through the meat grinder to see if it's been corrupted or not and we have our source and destination address. So there's our source that came from my computer, went to destination to uh, one of the Google servers, and then in reverse, the return packets are going to have these two swapped. And then you might have some additional information as well, but those are the basic fields of an IPv4 header, or an IPv6 header. They're all pretty much the same in some fashion. Uh, there's going to be some fields that are left out, some that are new. Uh, V6 is actually more simplistic. Uh, some of these fields are unnecessary now. Uh, and actually some of these are hidden on top of it in here but uh, they've, they've simplified it and made it faster to uh, process uh, with the simplified header with v6 
Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was this, was differentiated services. This is a built-in function to determine the quality of service. Remember I was talking about convergence of our networks and needing to provide a certain quality of service on our networks. If this was a voice over IP packet, I might have a certain differentiated service value to let the system know that this is a higher priority packet than the other packets. So that's one of the functions you can do. You can use quality of service as well, which is different from differentiated services, but uh, is a built-in functionality of our header here. So I believe that's all we're going to cover for now, and then we're going to jump into uh, subnets and, and networks and uh, how we can break them down and organize them. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of routing after that and, and move on from there uh, into actually creating our own subnets and really working with IPv4 some more.